Okay, this is David Zeeler, director of the Caltech Heritage Project. It is Monday, December 5th, 2022. It is great to be back with Ted Jenkins. Ted, as always, it's great to see you. Thanks for joining me. Yeah, by the way, speaking of December 5th and my family that you want to talk about, this is my father's birthday. He was born on in uh, 1917, and so he would have been 105 today. Oh, wow. You know, um, he made it to 73, but... Uh, a very, very interesting guy, um, was a welder during World War II at um, uh, Lockheed out there in, um, and this is when Lockheed was at the uh, Burbank Airport. And uh, he, so the Heliarc was uh, for aluminum welding and, uh, you know, they had not done that at all. And they were starting to make the planes with aluminum pieces and stuff like that. So anyway, it was, it was very interesting. And um, he, you know, he didn't go into the service, but, you know, in, in the World War II, we had probably um, eight or so employees for every um, army person and, or, uh, um, you know, uh, armed air force, uh, Navy, et cetera, in the, in the services. So, um, you know, everybody was doing their bit for, uh, for us during World War II. Well, Ted, let's go back even a little further. How many generations does your family go in California? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, my dad was born here, um, but his uh, his his parents uh, um, were Danish. They were called Orums. Oh, that O with the line through it, uh, R U M, uh, from Denmark. They came in through um, Mississippi, got married, and ended up in Hollywood. And that's where that's where my father was born. So he was the first one. Uh, my mother was actually born in Chanute, Kansas, and. Uh, so she got here when she was two years old. Um, her father uh, worked for um, the Santa Fe Railroad and was a fuel supervisor. So they lived all along Route 66 at different times, mostly in Kansas, a little bit in Oklahoma, which uh, nobody liked and uh, and whatever. And he came he came from uh, uh, out of the uh, uh, out of the eastern out of the uh, I believe, oh, I think he was born in Ohio and uh, spent time in Pennsylvania um, and growing up and then ultimately got into the railroad and was there. And my maternal uh, grandmother, uh, her last name was Shoemaker, and uh, she was from uh, Bloomsburg, uh, Pennsylvania. And, uh, you know, I, uh, off the top of my head, I can't do exactly how many generations uh, they were, but Back to why I'm a Jenkins and not an Orem. My uh, father was the youngest of four um, boys, and uh, his mother had uh, some mental illness or some other problems. And uh, I think they probably just passed him off as a convenient, um, uh, convenient adoption uh, to another landscaper whose name was Jenkins, also working in uh, in uh, uh, Hollywood. And, uh, and uh, you know, they, he stayed together with his uh, bio biological family. He'd go over for holidays and things like that. I've, I've met some of my Danish cousins and whatnot. So it's, uh, it's uh, interesting. I haven't, I haven't stayed really close. But um, so that's, and then at some point in time, they moved uh, to Glendale. And, uh, you know, that's where he met. Uh, well, he's actually in school with one of my uncles. Uh, grammar school and uh, then ended up meeting his uh, well, who was to be his wife you know later on <laughs> didn't know didn't do it through that connection so it's kind of interesting and I went to all the same schools so I actually had some same teachers that uh, my parents had. Ted did you have a relationship with any of your grandparents? Oh yeah yeah they they lived in Glendale and um, um, you know with the um, <clears throat> the the maternal grandparents would always have a lot of um, barbecue parties in the backyard uh, actually my dad helped make the the um, uh, barbecue it's it looks old-fashioned uh, uh, you know furnace that we used to burn uh, <laughs> uh, uh, you know uh, garden waste in and uh, and uh, he would it was it was great because he always um, did an album and um uh, would uh, write the menu on there and the temperature and uh, then uh, people would sign the page and put some comments and then he'd take a few pictures and they'd be you know at the bottom of that so 
Yeah, and, and those that he had, um, I had, uh, my mother had, f uh, there were five siblings. My mother had four and uh, a couple of those lived in the, in the, in the LA area. So we saw them quite often. And, um, uh, you know, so those, uh, that's how that worked. And my other uh, grandparents uh, uh, who adopted my dad, um, they were, uh, they didn't have any children of their own. So he was their only one. A lot of times they would babysit for us. We would go with them, but he, my grandfather was uh, really a um, really good chameleon nurseryman. He grew the plants in his backyard and uh, also uh, worked for um, a, a guy at the Markham estate. It was about uh, in Glendale. He was, um, uh, if for him, it, the walk was about three blocks up to the place and he would take care of, um, of, uh, the plants, uh, a lot of the camellias, they just grew out in a forest like situation. It was, was really nice, but Markham was the one who invented the, um, uh, air gun. And, uh, so that's how he made his, uh, his living. But, uh, yeah, we would, we would, uh, we would spend a lot of time with them and, uh, uh, you know, so I was, I, I really had a good relationship with him and my other grandfather was a, uh, also a pretty good uh, wood craftsman and made a lot of stuff and always working like that uh, in retirement. And the thing that he did for um, the uh, Santa Fe was uh, fuel supervision. He would coach the uh, engineers on how to operate their uh, trains so that it minimized the fuel consumption. And uh, uh, in uh, in retirement, he was actually recruited and one was was about one of five advisors that went over when Saudi Arabia built their uh, railroad. You know, this is in retirement for him. But, uh, uh, you know, all of them, none of them are still alive. I mean, they're, <laughs> we're getting, we're getting long in the tooth. So, I mean, I'm, I'm uh, in my 80th year, 79 right now. And so, uh, you know, it's hard for grandparents to survive that long. <laughs> Ted, do you know how your parents met? Um, yeah, there was, um, there was a couple, it was, uh, I think it was uh, on a double date. Uh, my, um, um, there's actually one of my classmates at school. His parents were the ones that, uh, uh, introduced them, uh, uh to each other. And, um, I don't know a, a lot of stories about that, but, uh, um, that's how it got started. And, um, uh, you know, living not too far from each other, it, uh, you know, was, uh, worked out. Neither, neither one went to high school. None of, none of my, um, none of my parents or grandparents had gone to college. I'm sorry, went to college. So, um, I was one of those first generation students, but, uh, um, anyway, that's, uh, that's how they met. And I, I want to say there's, <clears throat> they they went to the same high school, but there was a there's about a four or five year age difference. So obviously they would not have met in school. But um, um, yeah, they did that. And my father was good friends with um, uh, one of my uh, my uh, uh, mother's brothers. Uh, you know, they were actually in fourth grade with a teacher. I had that same teacher in junior high school. <laughs> so it's. Is really funny, um, but at any rate, yeah, that's that's basically. And and where um, were your parents living when you were born? Uh, my parents were uh, they were living in Glendale. That's why I was I was born in Glendale. We were we were for my whole life. We were up in the Verdugo Woodlands region of Glendale. And uh, when I was born, I think they were they were renting an apartment um, on Verdugo Road, twenty twenty, <laughs> and uh, then we moved up to a. a place on uh, my, my grandfather helped uh, my dad buy it and uh, they uh, the, the uh, paternal grandfather and that was up on uh, uh, El Rito Boulevard between uh, lock and, between uh, Kenyatta and uh, and um, Verdugo Road not too far from that uh, that uh, a wash that runs down through that valley what level of education did your parents achieve? Uh, they were all, they were both high school graduates. And um, my mother, uh, while she was in school, actually um, uh, took, um, you know, learned stenography and other kinds of uh, office skills and that sort of thing. And um, 
there were there were times where there was one time when this is before uh, workers comp my dad uh, uh, hurt his knee and and couldn't work for a while and my mother went back to work in downtown LA as a as an as, as an administrative assistant or secretary um, and um, my father uh, went through high school and uh, obviously his uh, his uh, father was this uh, nurseryman so he got exposed to that, but uh, he had an uncle that um, had a sheet metal shop and uh, so over in Hollywood. So he actually did that for a while. And uh, one time the, um, either the welder quit or whatever, and they asked somebody to, uh, if anybody knew about welding, my dad shook up his hands and didn't know it, but told him he'd, he'd learn it. So that's how, he, that's how he got into that. Do you know the story of how your dad got into welding? Well, it was through that, um, it was through his uncle's sheet metal shop. And um, so, I mean, there's also, there's a lot of bending and, and fitting and screwing things together, but there was also welding. So he, that's where he learned welding. And, and uh, what was his first job as a welder? Um, probably in that, um, in that shop, uh, working there as a, as a, as a welder, he, he ended up, uh, he worked uh, for some of the uh, movie studios too, RKO, I remember. And he um, he would uh, uh, help build the movie props that they were going to use, like maybe modifying a car or something like that. Um, when uh, he had a, he had a, uh, uh, a Ford, uh, 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 I guess it was a sedan. I can't. I think it was a thirty-two or something like that. And he ended up uh, chopping it down, so he ended up having a lower uh, a roof on the thing just to make it a little jazzier. So that that's the kind of stuff that he got into. When I was a young kid, he built a big shop in the backyard. We had a extra space in the back of our yard, and um, he had a, a, a welding equipment, a compressor. He painted cars with. Uh, lacquer and uh, a lot of stuff like that. We ended up building some um, some uh, ski boats while I was a kid. He, he made us he made us kids a big uh, welded up a big uh, um, spring swing for us that was, uh, you know, like out of a uh, uh, two inch <laughs> pipe, you know, in that big frame and whatnot. Uh, so and I <clears throat> as the oldest of the three of us, uh, I ended up uh, being the welder's helper a lot. <laughs> he, he actually also invented a, a, a ski rack that you could put onto a convertible. He would um, rivet a couple of, a, 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 a little piece of a hinge there that you could slide a pin through to, to mount the, uh, to mount the uh, ski rack there and uh, actually had uh, some uh, springs that would uh, hold the, hold the skis in on there. So he was, you know, he's very, he's creative in a lot of ways, that as well as um, uh, art. He, he actually welded up a lot of, uh, a lot of art as well. He, you know, he, he took a, uh, he took a, uh, one of these five gallon tin cans that's square and uh, actually melted out uh, a bunch of uh, shapes of, uh, of, th of uh, things that look like um, uh, uh, goldfish, you know, with the, wing, with the fins and stuff like that. And, welded a, a, a thing of those together to hang on the um, inlet of my, the wall of my place at the Delta. <laughs> Ted, so, would you say growing up you had a, a middle-class childhood? Um, yeah, I would say so. We didn't, um, you know, I uh, wasn't, we weren't rich, but, um, um, you know, with the help from my grandfather, we were able to get this house that we owned and my dad, he, I mean, basically, he loaned the money. My dad was making payments to him, and at some point along the line, he says, "Okay, that's uh, that's all I need," <laughs> and uh, stuff like. I mean, it was the house was like twenty four thousand or something like that in those days? It's probably probably a thousand times that today. I don't know. Anyway, um, uh, no, not a thousand, but a hundred times. Um, but um, uh, not not super. Uh, wealthy but uh, you know the other thing back in those days uh, we could drive up highway two into the mountains there um, and uh, get to a couple places to ski cracker ridge and uh, 
and uh, Mount Waterman. My parents took their honeymoon on uh, at uh, Yosemite and stayed in Camp Curry. You know, the Camp Curry is those places that are little kind of uh, almost, uh, they've got some wooden walls, but uh, tent toppings and stuff like that. They're very, very sort of sparse, a little bit like camping out. And um, they they were able to ski up at Badger Pass. So, the, but they skied all along. I started, they, they got me going when I was about five years old doing that. So, you know, we could do stuff like that. So it wasn't, uh, you know, we were not poor. We, we were, we were okay. Now, did you go to Glendale public schools growing up? Absolutely. Yes. Um, went to, um, Verdugo Woodlands, which is the name of the school. It's, uh, just a little bit North of, um, of Glendale college. And it's, you know, kind of halfway in between, um, uh, Verdugo road and, uh, Kenyatta and uh, then went to Woodrow Wilson Junior High School. And that was, the, that was the time when I started going to the same school as my parents went to. They went to that one. Um, ours was a new campus, though, in those days. And that's, uh, that's right near um, downtown Glendale. And then uh, went on to Glendale High School. The, the other uh, high school story I have to tell you is after my junior year of high school, my parents, uh, my dad bought a a distributorship in uh, Houston and so they moved down there and uh, uh, because of academic as well as social reasons I didn't want to move and my aunt and uncle had bought our house so um, I cooked a deal with them where I could <laughs> I could spend the, the last year before college uh, at that point. Ted even as a young boy were you always interested in science and math and building stuff? Um, yeah, I, uh, you know, the building stuff, um, I, one thing, one nice thing about this whole deal was that um, my parents uh, treated me with all, I, gave me all these manual skills. I mean, I, I told you about the stuff my dad and I worked on, but my mom uh, also uh, taught me how to type. And, uh, you know, that's back before they had electronic, electrical typer. And then, um, you know, she says, here's where you hold your fingers. You go like this. And, and uh, you know, spent about 15 minutes with me. And she says, okay, now it's all practice. <laughs> and then uh, she also taught me how to use a sewing machine. And uh, so I did that. And not, not so much cooking, but I would see a little bit of stuff out there from time to time and was interested in, in how that went. But in terms of... Uh, Science, uh, yeah, I think I probably did. I was, uh, uh, my dad was not very good at electrical stuff, uh, but I was, uh, I was kind of curious about that. I, I got this book. Um, uh, I think one of our neighbors gave it to me or something like that. Uh, they were across the street. I'd sometimes I'd go over and see him early in the morning and it's called, uh, and this, this shows you how much our uh, uh, attitude has changed over time, but it's called the first electrical book for boys. So, you know, and the Ohm's law was in there, volts, amps, all that other stuff. And in, so I was playing with this stuff. I mean, Cub Scouts, I put together a crystal set and uh, was interested in, in things like that. And um, we put in a swimming pool at the house when I was 10. And um, one of the guys, the, the husband and this couple that introduced my parents was a good electrician. He helped do a lot of that, but I was able to work along beside him as we were wiring in the, you know, the pumps and uh, and uh, other things like that, lights and whatnot. And so um, uh, I got some experience at that. But in in junior high school, um, I ended up uh, I actually put together some heat kits and actually got my amateur radio license when I was in about eighth grade. I want to say another. I met a good, very good friend who came from a different grammar school. His name was, his name is Ken Shamergola. And, uh, we were, we were really both into, uh, that kind of stuff. We got our licenses together and, uh, we built equipment together and, uh, you know, used that and, uh, did, uh, a bunch of other project. It was, uh, he kind of liked the idea my dad had the shop and we would put different creative ideas of things together, both either mechanical or whatever. And, uh, so that was, that was a, that was a good experience growing up and really stimulated the 
interest in science and whatnot. So I, you know, I, I, I made, I made my receiver as a Heath kit. I remember, no, I think it was an allied radio kit. And I, my, um, I made my, uh, transmitter from a kit and, uh, actually my dad helped me put up a big, uh, a big uh, pole that we could stretch, uh, the antenna from back in the back by his shop. <laughs> so lots of, uh, lots of interesting things in association with that. So the thing that I really like about that, and I think it's probably unusual for, uh, maybe a lot of the people at Caltech was. I ended up learning a lot of manual skills that I wouldn't have otherwise had. I mean, I, I did take a wood shop, metal shop, drafting, um, and, uh, print shop in, you know, in junior high school, but, uh, just being able to do all that other stuff was, uh, was really helpful. And, uh, I think it, it, it also really made, um, uh, it easy for me to work in laboratories. Now, in high school, would you say your your curriculum was strong in math and science? Uh, yes, it was. Um, yeah, I took, um, I, you know, I was one of these things where I sort of decided, you know, they didn't make you uh, take all the stuff, but I was kind of looking at it and I was doing a little bit of looking ahead um, at college and saying, well, you know, what do I have to have to get that? And so I, I, took, well, I, I took the whole math curriculum. I took... Um, I took uh, chemistry and physics. One thing I, I um, one thing I sort of, uh, I, I, I realized that you had to pick one side or the other. I really picked the physical science as opposed to the biology sciences. So I, I didn't take biology in, uh, in high school. I just, I didn't have room for it and uh, wanted to do the other stuff. Uh, but my other, my buddy did, he took that. Um, um, it's, it's funny because you know, you talk about this thing. One of the things that uh, he did, uh, he was he had to do a biology experiment uh, experiment for um, his biology class, and he ended up uh, coming up with a a little small little centrifuge where he grew radishes that um, that were uh, sort of uh, loaded with about seven G's of, of gravity compared to what they would normally grow in and how would they grow and what would happen and everything else. So they came up, they were very entangled kind of things, but they grew as much as they would have even in the natural G. But, you know, that those are the kinds of things that we were thinking about, you know, as we were going through high school, that was actually in high school, of course, but uh, really, uh, I, I mean, I didn't know anybody else that was doing, you know, anything like that you know, my, my, among my friends or anything else. So it was interesting period. Ted, I wonder if in, in middle school, in high school, if Caltech was sort of the, the, the dream for you, if that's where you knew you wanted to go. Well, my dad was the first one that brought it up and he, and he mentioned Caltech. And so, um, yeah, uh, that was, that was on my list. Um, and then, um, uh, it, down in Houston, um, uh, Rice University, uh, if they admitted you as a private uh, school, but there was no tuition, they were so well endowed, they didn't need to uh, charge any tuition. So he said, why, why don't you apply to Rice? There's no tuition. And I said, well, I'm not sure it's as good a school as Caltech. And he said, well, okay. Anyway, I, I applied I applied to Caltech and Rice. And uh, I... Uh, ended up having interviews with both of them. the one at Rice. I had to go over and, and visit them. And I, w I was dressed up pretty well. I had a, I, I didn't have a, a coat and tie on, but I did have a, I did have a, you know, a, a, a nice shirt and shoes and slacks and whatnot. But um, um, even though I got uh, 800 on the SAT math, um, they didn't, they didn't admit me right away. They ultimately did later on, but um, Caltech did. So I, um, I uh, tell people that, uh, yeah, well, I mean, um, it was the only place I got admitted. I had to go there. <laughs> <laughs> the, the other, the thing that, uh, the, the thing that had my, my backup plan was back in those days, if you had the requirements for University of California, you could apply in August and, and if you had those, if you graduated from high school and you'd taken the courses that you needed there, they would let you in. And, you know, obviously there was no tuition. So I probably would have gone to UCLA or Berkeley um, had I not gotten accepted at Caltech. But uh, that that worked out really very well. So it was 
was a simple thing. I, um, you know, applied and I had, uh, I think the guy was the, the guy that interviewed me was the psychologist from the health center or something like that. And, uh, you know, that went fine. And, you know, so here I am. <laughs> Ted, it was 1961 when you first arrived on campus? Uh, yes, it was. That's my high school graduation year. Yes. What were your first impressions? What sticks out in your memory when you got to Caltech? <clears throat> well, the biggest one is, uh, and if you looked at the calendar, you could see why. Um, uh, the uh, uh, the core curriculum uh, was uh, Physics 1, you know, the first year, Physics 2, the same. We Compared to other schools, we have all very simple numbers when you're um, you know, in your first couple of years, but, um, I was in that original Feynman class. The physics department had decided that they were going to, um, uh, redo, uh, the physics, uh, uh, curriculum and stuff. And they wanted Feynman to do the lectures, but they, it was all hands on deck. They had Robert Layton helping him with uh, a lot of stuff. And, um, um, then they had some people that were redoing the laboratories. I mean, one of the nice things about sophomore physics lab was we actually re we're actually able to do the Millikan oil drop experiment to uh, figure out the charge on the electron. And uh, there was a there was really a lot of good stuff. I mean, we <laughs> the one that was still blows my mind about um, um, a physics lab was. Uh, we actually had a 22 that we shot into a dowling that was inside of a piece of pipe in the lab. So, I mean, here we are firing off a gun inside the laboratory to see how much, you know, the transfer of momentum and stuff like that. And it was, it was an interesting thing. And speaking of that, by the way, one of the very first, um, Feynman always liked to do an interesting demonstration with the, with the, uh, with the, with the, uh, stuff he was trying to teach. And uh, so the very first one that we saw was we're in 201 Bridge. You've been in that. Have you been in that lab? Yes. In that building? Yeah. Okay. So he had a uh, he had a bowling ball on a rope attached from the arch up at the top of the of the th of the thing above the um, uh, blackboards, and he um, he was on the side and he pulled this back. He pulled this ball back with him held it right in front of his nose and said, uh, this is a conservative force field. And uh, he says, minus a little bit of uh, air resistance, um, this ball is going to come right back to my nose. He says, now I got to be careful not to lean forward or lean back um, because, uh, you know, then it might hit me pretty hard. But uh, he says, uh, just, uh, just take a look and watch this. So he releases it, it goes over comes right back up and he grabs it again and it's so you know here I am uh, what are we talking about about 60 years later you know telling you stories that uh, that I saw in that lab that he had done and uh, so the the Feynman lectures were the most memorable in fact we were able to recruit him at our 25th reunion uh, to to come and speak to us and uh, we actually had a, a session actually in our 50th we had a session where we we're back in that lab, and um, I gave a little bit of an inter back in that uh, uh, lecture hall. I was able to give a little bit of a uh, um, a preview precursor to it, and then we had a, a just a open mic uh, telling old Feynman stories about uh, what had what had gone on there in that in that hall and everything else. One of the other things that was memorable. Well, there's two other things that were memorable. One was one of his uh, demonstrations that he did was he had a had a thing set up where he had a a, a screen and uh, two uh, uh, two screens and two water hose uh, water uh, showers that were going down through this and these were cross connected like this um, and the the point that he made was he says that um, we've got a slight static imbalance here. Um, and when the water goes through the structure, it's going to amplify the, the voltage difference because it'll trans as it as it changes, it'll transfer more and more to make the voltage higher. And he was he had a a, a grounded uh, uh, stick that he put up there, and he was able to draw some arcs that were I don't know about two feet from this 
thing that was, you know, he's trying to tell us about the Tesla stuff and everything else, but it was, uh, it, those were always, uh, he always had some great, interesting stuff like that. But the other thing I was going to tell you, we would occasionally invite uh, professors to come and have dinner with us in the student houses. And uh, we had him come to Lloyd House. And we were, I was, this was, um, I think after I was out of his class, but uh, uh, we would, uh, we were getting ready. It was in the spring. We're getting ready for the uh, swimming championship uh, meet. And uh, people were, people were running around talking about, well, should I, should I shave my legs? Should I shave my chest? What do I, is it uh, emotional? Is it uh, physical or whatever else? So when Feynman was over din for dinner, um, one of the questions that came up was, well, you know, we're, we're, we're coming up on this, um, on this, uh, uh, water championship. Um, you know, should we shave our legs or what are we doing? He says, Hmm, let me, let me think about this. And he says, um, why don't you shave one leg and see if you swim in a circle? <laughs> That's great. So, you know, you, you can't, you know, it's hard to forget stuff like that, you know, because he's, we're melding physics with, um, you know, our, what, what's, uh, our, our personal life. <laughs> now, Ted, coming in like so many other undergraduates, was the plan for you to become a physics major? Was that your game plan from the beginning? <clears throat> no, I was, I was always kind of, uh, I, I really liked the engineering part of things, probably because of you know, the practical experience that I'd had. And, um, you know, I, I, I liked electronics. I was interested in that stuff, um, you know, knew about that. And, uh, you know, so I was, I was kind of, uh, probably would have liked to have been what I thought was an old fashioned engineer. So I was, I was taking a look at those things and it was kind of interesting. The, the degree that you get uh, as an undergrad is, is not an electrical engineering degree or a mechanical engineering degree. It's an engineering degree. So I ended up taking uh, mechanical courses uh, or one or two and uh, electrical, uh, you know, I took whatever, you know, the, the, the uh, electrical engineering path, but, you know, you really couldn't take a um, electrical engineering course until uh, uh, I think you'd been through physics too, because that's where you, they teach you electricity and magnetism, Maxwell's equation. And uh, so, you know, you, uh, you really only get into that your last uh, couple of years and you're, you're learning the other stuff. You have to take, it was two years of, uh, uh, two years of physics, two years of math, um, and uh, had to have, a, it took Kim one in your uh, freshman year. You, you didn't have to take any more of that. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, you had those labs and, uh, oh, we also had, you know, a fairly good dose of, um, uh, of, uh, humanities, uh, had both English and history. And, uh, when I compared my, uh, uh, college, uh, experience with other people, like from the university of California, I had probably had twice as much humanities as they did in terms of units. Um, uh, and, uh, there were no there were no humanitarian degrees in uh, at Caltech when I was there, so the all of the professors were really operating mostly as like instructors, and uh, they were they were really really good. I really had a great experience with the, with those people, um, and because I was kind of interested in business, I I took a business econ course which I really liked. That was that was later on. Um, and I, I took these engineering courses and I was, I was kind of interested in some of the material science. I took um, uh, some of that stuff. And I was, as I was going along, I, and being from ham radio, the, the vacuum tubes were much, much, much more uh, capable at high frequencies and high powers than transistors could do. And, uh, you know, there was, there was no way that, you know, you, uh, you'd get into uh, uh you know, a transistor transmitter or anything like that. So I was, but I was interested in um, where the, where that uh, technology was going. And that so that was the, cause I, I could kind of see that it was really moving along. There was a lot of dynamics and, uh, and it would be uh, probably an interesting space, but I always complained about it um, going through Caltech uh, 
to my classmates. And then when they found out I was going to work in the semiconductor industry, they said, Ted, what, uh, what's going on there? You, uh, you, um, uh, you know what, I, uh, what's going on there? You, uh, you know, I, and I said, oh, you, you dissed it so bad. And, uh, they said, well, um, I think the time's about right. <laughs> I saw a woman walk up to my door. One of my neighbors. Let me sure let me thing. Take Go ahead. A brief break here, and I'll be right back. Hey, Bonnie. Oh, thank you. I'm uh, I'm on the uh, a Zoom call right now, so I, I can't send them. Well, that really, that really was, and and I'm a, uh, I, I, Ginger said, Ted, you shouldn't have brought that thing up about the Mormon Church, but you know what? I said, you know, and and I said, you know, Bonnie's got just the right temperament about that, and uh, yeah, sure, yeah, no, I know, but uh, um, and I know that's not your culture either. <laughs> Yeah. And, 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 the, and the current Mormon church is just, you know, they are Latter day Saints. They are trying to Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it was. It was really a lot of fun. Bye. I'm back. Ted, tell Did you me what, what I was saying. No, what was it? Oh, we went to a um, uh, a Christmas uh, carol uh, event last night. Uh, one of our one of our neighbors uh, sings in the local chorale here, and we took uh, one of our other neighbors uh, uh, that uh, uh, lived with us and actually ran the Boy Scout troop that my uh, and uh, Boy Scout and the well, even Cub Scouts before that. Um, and she was uh, was associated with the Mormon Church. We had a little bit of trouble getting into the thing with my son, but we were we we spoke very strongly about how much we would help because they that was they, you know that's part of the Mormon culture. They're very communal oriented, and uh, so we took her with us last night. She just dropped a thank you note off back. <laughs> oh, that's so nice. Yeah, yeah, she is. She's really, she's really the real. She's, she's been a widow now for I don't know three or four years. So, um, but she's, uh, she's, she's really good. She, she taught organizational uh, skills at a, a vocational school around here. So she's, she's, uh, she's really a good person. Anyway, so Ted, back to Caltech as an undergraduate. Did you have any interface with computers, even in their early forms, when you were at Caltech? <laughs> I did a little bit. I mean, we, they, uh, uh, they had, uh, I took a computer science class and it was really uh, sort of from, and one of the things that they had us do was um, put some code on a Burroughs 220. And this was, a, this was an older thing because at the same time, we also had an IBM 7090 slash 7094 and um, you know the ones you put the Fortran cards in, so we had that in uh, in the steel building. But um, uh, this, they asked us to uh, uh, work with this other computer, which was an older one. I don't know, I don't know how old it was, but it was a Burroughs 220. It only had a 10,000 word drum memory, and it had no operating system. So when you wrote code for it, you had the uh, put the algorithms uh, for your uh, calculations in, I mean, in the steps and everything, and then say where to put the data and how to get it out, all this other stuff. Um, and it was, uh, it was uh, uh, very, very, um, I mean, I guess in the time frame it came out, it was probably amazing, but on the other hand, it was not, not nearly as simple to use as, uh, you know, current machines. And the um, the IBM did have its own operating system and it had functions you could use and things like that. But you know it's back to those days with a deck of uh, <laughs> of, of those cards you know, that are like this. In and out on the Burroughs two twenty was um, uh, a teletype was the printer, 
And um, when you put to put your code in, you had this paper tape that had um, a possibility of eight holes across, and those were the those were the bits in the byte. <laughs> so <laughs> that's how you put your code in. And that was, I mean, this is this is when I was um, I can't I, I think it was maybe my senior senior or master's year. So, I mean, that's like 65 or 66, 64, 65, 66. <clears throat> but um, um, it was uh, it was a good lesson, you know, good to see that. But it's not, nothing like it is today, obviously. Ted, just a point of clarification. You said you took a computer science class. My understanding that the development of a computer science graduate program, that came later. And then for undergraduates, it came much later. So were there computer science classes, but there wasn't really a department that housed them? Um, I yeah, I think this was actually I don't this might have been a double E class probably, and uh, maybe it was in my master's year. It was my master's or senior year. I I'd, I'd have to go back and look at it, but it's um, yeah, they did not have a computer science um, um, uh, election or anything else. It was. You know, it was just it was just um, it was just starting, and uh, quite frankly, Caltech um, got a little bit of a late start to computer science. But um, you know, we've been accelerating along really very well. Adam Weirman's done a great job on that. Tell me about meeting Carver Mead for the first time. Where where was that? <laughs> well, I had the nostalgia of going right by that building. I, I met Carver Mead in uh, Spalding. No, no, let's see. No, I'm sorry. I mean, that's where I met Gordon Moore. I'm trying to think. I knew that he was, um, hmm, might have been taking his class. Um, I'm not sure. My first uh, advisor at, at, as an undergrad was Hardy Martell. And um, then it was, um, ooh, I'm trying to remember the guy. He was a specialist in magnetism. Um, and then uh, when I became a grad student, I uh, I got to Carver because I was interested in that sort of uh, in that uh, part of the double E department. And uh, wow, I'm trying to re I mean, I have uh, I have a lot of Carver stories, but I uh, I can't uh, I can't remember the exact first time. I mean, I might I might have uh, crashed his office and just asked him if he could, uh, you know, what I was interested in, if he could be my advisor. I, I think that's. I think that's what I actually did, and in that, in that, in my era there, um, the electrical engineers were actually in Spalding, mm -hmm. which was shared with the chemists, and so um, you know Carver's lab was there, um, Amnon Yarif was there, um, um, and um, you know that's why since I mentioned Gordon Moore, I'll go ahead and tell that story as well. But that's Carver's the one that introduced uh, about half a dozen of us uh, to. Uh, uh, Gordon Moore and uh, Gordon says if this was in the spring of my master's year and and he's the one that said uh, uh, hey if you're looking he told us about three different stories of stuff they were working on at uh, Fairchild R&D and then he says hey if you're looking for work we're hiring um, call this number and uh, schedule a visit and uh, you know that's all I ever did I don't even think I pr prepared a resume for them Amazing. and I went up and had uh, six interviews at, at Fairchild R&D, which was in the Stanford Industrial Park. It was separate from the Fairchild uh, factory and, and business place. And, um, uh, you know, it was great. Actually, even Andy Grove was one of my interviewers as a, a, a new college graduate. We, call, you call, we used to call them NCGs. <laughs> um, but, uh, uh, and I got a couple of offers and ended up going to work in linear integrated circuits there. But, uh, but Carver, um, Ted, do you was, know, do you know what Carver was working on when you first met him? Uh, yeah, I do. He was working on metal semiconductor contacts and, um, uh, you know, basically, and, and quite, it's, it's, it's kind of interesting because if you think about it, the original crystal sets were a metal semiconductor contact. You had this little, cat whisker, they called it, and you'd touch down on uh, galena, which is lead sulfide, and that would make a diode, and that's how uh, that's how the crystal set would work. Um, but he was uh, into depositing things. He also worked on uh, um, 
uh, superconducting materials as well. He did some experimentation on that as well. Um, but yeah, he was looking at, uh, and there was a, you know, there was could make depending on what the uh, uh, what the bandwidth or what the um, what the uh, it's not bandwidth, but what's the uh, the size of the uh, oh the the gap in the semiconductors, how how much it was, and uh, so he was he was doing. Um, uh, looking at different kinds of metals, different kinds of semiconductors together to, to see which of those were uh, diodes and whatnot. It actually, uh, that stuff actually helped me with a, the probably the first patent I ever got, which was on uh, aluminum silicon Schottky barrier diode. So anyway, some of those were with, um, some of those were diodes, some were, you know, uh, going through uh, a, uh, a very thin layer of the of the forbidden gap they called it ted was your sense was carver working with any other faculty on campus was he basically a one-man operation at that point um mostly although um yeah the you know the um trying to trying to think there were probably some things where the um you know where there might have been some materials connection or you know some other some other stuff, but I think, yeah, pretty much he was working mostly on his own, I want to say. Now, when you asked him to be your advisor, would that have been for undergrad or for your master's program? That was that was for my master's degree. And what was the thought process for you to stay on for the master's? Well, as I said, you know, you couldn't take any engineering until the last two years, and I really wanted, uh, I, I thought that I needed a little more. I mean, there was, there was also... Um, there was a lot of bias, I, bias, depends on who you talk to, but there were a lot of people that really felt that most of our students should move on to, um, academia and get a PhD. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, I didn't think I needed one, but I thought I, 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 I thought to be competitive in the job market, I'd uh, get a little more, uh, a little, you know, another degree I could do it in a year and, uh, and it, um, it would end up being a, a you know, a, a good thing for me. And, and it was, I mean, I got to do a little more research and I got to uh, take some additional courses and, uh, um, you know, I, I felt pretty good. And then, you know, a, a lot of times I'll tell people that uh, the, the couple of years I spent at uh, Fairchild R and D uh, kind of, <laughs> kind of launched me through my PhD. <laughs> But with you know, two years is enough to get a PhD. But I ended up getting you know exposure to a lot of uh, a lot of incremental um, uh, uh, you know science and uh, development things that were going on in the transistor business. What was it like working with Carver? Was it hands on? Would you meet with him every day? Did he give you the ideas of projects to work on? Um, not so much. He uh, he would he gave me a. a he gave me a, a couple of things that I ended up working on and they were more materials oriented and, uh, you know, I'd work in the lab and, uh, you know, I would, uh, I would periodically, you know, every once, maybe two weeks, uh, um, you know, I'd go in and share the data that I'd gotten, but it was, uh, that was, that was kind of the way it worked out. It was not, it was, it was, um, it was more like, I, I, well, I think it was, it was actually, um, um, I actually had some research as a part of the classes that I was taking, and he was the one that told me what it would be and whatever. So he sort of uh, set it up for me. There, I think I did a couple of different projects like that, but it was pretty much working on your own. And it, uh, it was, um, it was. I mean, I I felt very comfortable with that. We'd go back and we'd talk about what the results were, you know, infer the science uh, from that. Now, was there a formal thesis that you wrote up for the master's program? Uh, no, I did not. The the um, Caltech was not doing that in those days, and I'm not. I don't think we do today either, do we? You know, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. You, usually, for the master's program, it's just sort of incidental on the way to the PhD. Yes, yes, um, but um, um, for a lot of engineers, it's terminal. So, uh, and it's is. I mean, yeah. Sometimes the PhDs. Uh, <laughs> 
applicants get thrown out there. But uh, you know, I was I was really headed for the for the end of it there, and the courses were pretty well designed to you know add on another year's worth of experience. I I thought it was pretty good. Ted, what was it like meeting Gordon Moore at that point? Um, you know, I I didn't. I didn't know how famous he was at that point in time. I learned a little more um, uh, later on, but um, he was um, uh, he was uh, really uh, really interesting. And I, you know, he he came in and as I said, uh, you know, he told this uh, Carver was a consultant for Fairchild R and D, so that's how he got the connection. But I'm sure Gordon was. They were looking. I'm sure they were recruiting, and you know, Carver's. Uh, a group would be a good uh, a good choice for them. So he, uh, uh, he Gordon came there. Carver said to, had given us, uh, and I want to say there were about six of us in that little conference room in Spalding. And uh, Gordon Gordon tells this story, and uh, um, you know, of course, we knew we knew he was a PhD from uh, Caltech. I didn't know quite as much about his. Uh, business experience, but um, I can tell that to you later here. But it, it because uh, I, uh, being in the business, you know, you find out about it. Uh, um, and there's a strong Caltech connection with Silicon Valley. Uh, but uh, you know, he told these stories; they were very interesting. Um, the one that I specifically remember, he was talking about uh, uh, higher power transistors and uh, how they'd. Uh, you know, you'd start with this. You start with a basic wafer. Let's say you're trying to make an NPN transistor. The um, uh, you start with an N N type wafer, which would be uh, doped at not a heavy level, but uh, another one. Then you'd diffuse a P um, uh, base into it, what became a base of the pin NPN transistor, and then you diffuse an emitter into it, and you connect up the emitter, the base, and you forward bias the emitter and that would send minority carriers off um, into the uh, into the collector and um, there was an amplification there you know you could get uh, you'd, you'd say put a certain amount of current through the uh, through the collect uh, through the emitter base and then you could get like a hundred times that coming out of the collector base that's how transistor worked as an amplifier and uh, but in a high power transistor um, you know, you could, uh, there'd be some uh, variations from, you know, uh, the size and distances and stuff like that. So one of the things that they did was they put these different emitters in there and then they would put some uh, resistance in series with that so that uh, if it started drawing too much power or whatever, its voltage would rise and would automatically uh, 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 cut itself down a little bit so it wouldn't be destructive. So they put multiple um, emitters in here and then put a little bit of resistance between that and the emitter connection. And that was, it sounded like a very clever thing to do, you know, and it made, kind of made you think about, well, the engineers are thinking about <clears throat> interesting developments in this, uh, in this uh, technology going forward. Now, even as a graduate student, did you have a sense of just how revolutionary the work was at Fairchild, what they were doing? Um, well, they had a they had a really good reputation. I mean, <clears throat> they were the they were the largest. I think I think they were actually not sure. No, I don't think they were quite as big as TI in those days. But they were uh, doing well, and they were really doing well in integrated circuits. So, um, and they had uh, a, a, a good list of those products. Motorola was also doing very well. So those were the, those were the big ones. But I but. Um, Fairchild was encroaching in on them, and so um, that was uh, that was interesting. Plus, it's in California, so you know I <laughs> wanted to stay in California, being a, a native here. So that's uh, that was another factor in my my decision. And actually, I'm not sure I applied uh, anywhere else, you know, um, for for my job. Now, even for a second, did you give any thought to staying on for the PhD? Um, not much, really, no. And when you when you made that decision to call Fairchild, what were you hoping? What did you want to accomplish at that point? Um, well, um, I was just looking for an interesting job where I could keep uh, keep pushing um, 
you know, the technology forward and, and help out with uh, part of the business activity of it. Um, and so that's why I ended up working in um, um, linear integrated circuits. And, uh, you know, we were developing new technologies for the the manufacturing people. And then, of course, the marketing people down there had to find, uh, you know, the new technology. But I mean, what, what Fairchild was doing in those days was they called them operational amplifiers. And so these were amplifiers that you could use for, um, you know, um, um, magnifying uh, sound and, you know, those kinds of things in optic, in, um, in uh, sorry, sound equipment and those kinds of things. Or, you know, controlling, um, controlling, um, you know, mechanical things as well. So, I mean, all of that stuff, those, those, uh, those op amps were good for connecting sensors to, um, you know, didn't have really have robots, but there would be things that you'd want to control or, um, you know, even thermostats and, you know, stuff like that. Ted, graduating in 1966, even before you take on the new job, was the draft something you needed to contend with? Was military service in Vietnam on your radar at all? Uh, absolutely. You had to... Uh, you know, you had to you had to uh, uh, register for the um, uh, for the draft in um, when you turned eighteen. So I didn't turn eighteen till I was uh, actually at uh, at work. Uh, I'm born in September, but uh, yes, I had to do that, and it was uh, it was a, a very big deal. Except at Fairchild, I actually had a um, a secret uh, clearance and I was working on things that could be used for um, bomb fuses uh, and uh, I, I wasn't you know involved in any of any uh, uh, military uh, research or anything like that but the, since the stuff uh, qualified for that uh, I I could get a deferment and I was able to do that and uh, you know Fairchild supported me in that. Tell me about that initial interview at Fairchild. What was that like? Well, um, I went up there. I had six um, uh, uh, six different places to talk to, and I think it was like about forty five minutes per each of those. And uh, so I, I talked to somebody in linear integrated circuits. I talked to Andy Grove. He was doing surface physics. Um, you know, they're trying to they were working on getting MOS transistors working. Um, uh, they also had a transducer section, so I talked to those. Those are ones that where you can, uh, silicon has the capability to uh, um, uh, measure uh, infrared uh, signals and stuff like that. So uh, it was, uh, they did those kinds of things. So I, I got kind of a, a good vision of, uh, of, you know, the fundamental physics uh, or fundamental um, research that they were doing, plus, um, you know, what some of the engineering activity was, which was kind of what I was interested in. So the, the linear integrated circuits is, I, I got a, I think I got an offer from them and also from the uh, 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 device development section of R&D. Um, and I really liked the idea of the, of the uh, integrated circuit one. So I ended up going with the linear integrated circuits and it sort of fit my interest in terms of uh, audio, uh, you know, electronics and things like that. Ted, drawing on your education at Caltech, what aspects were really fundamental that were just important for you as you were starting your career? And what areas where did you have the most experience in applied work coming to Fairchild? Well, um, you know, when you're when you're working there, you can um, they they have this sort of this central fab capacity where, where you can put uh, uh, you don't you know you have to define your own process you know you say you have to you know you have to provide them with a mask set and the um, and the instructions and then you have to take it over to the um, uh, diffusion area and oxidation area and have all of that stuff done so you have to actually write out exactly what you want of uh, you know uh, specify all this stuff as you're going through and um uh, so that, so I wasn't, I didn't have to um, put my wafers in the, in the furnace or things like that. You could just turn them in and the masking room would do the masking. But uh, having all of that, uh, uh, you know, material science and chemistry, 
you know, and you think about the chemistry, you know, as you go in college through chemistry, a lot of it is um, biochemistry, you know, because that's where, but all of this stuff was, um, was uh, basically, uh, you know, material science and uh, inorganic chemistry. Uh, so that was, uh, that stuff really helped. Um, and um, uh, I would say the material science too. I mean, my first invention came from um, the aluminum silicon Schottky diode and Schottky is not to be confused with Shockley, but it's, it's basically the metal semiconductor diode. And that's, you know, as a, and as I said, the Galena is actually the first semiconductor we, we had in the crystal set and um, then going in and, uh, you know, and then, we, by the way, uh, Fairchild also taught us a class in, um, in um, uh, uh, semiconductor processing. So we learned, they taught us about diffusion and the, and the formulas for that, oxidation, how it grows. And they, they actually had a manual that they gave us, which uh, gave us some of the factors to calculate how, how far this stuff would go and uh, et cetera from the diffusing these minority carriers in there or these minority uh, impurities in there. And the, you know, so that plus the stuff I had at Caltech was really, was really a great way to, to deal with all of this. But yes, I did need, I did need that additional education um, at Fairchild, which, uh, um, you know, they had PhD physicists teaching that to all of us. So, and actually, actually Andy Grove's first book, if most people don't even think about this, was uh, about uh, semiconductor process and engineering. Ted, I'm sure you've heard the stories about Bell Labs and their interest in supporting basic science, whether or not it had value to the company's bottom line. Was there a similar research culture at Fairchild? Could you pursue things even if it wasn't immediately apparent if they had business value? Um, you know, it um, the part of the thing that uh, part of the uh, organization that I worked in, it was pretty clearly it was, um, you know, linked to uh, business. But there were some um, they were working on some things, for example, uh, you know, uh, the uh, the uh, silicon gate MOS uh, transistors that uh, I think Fairchild was really one of the early ones on there where they put uh, they put down some uh, uh, multi uh, multi crystal um, well it's very fine grain but uh, uh, deposited some uh, silicon uh, material on there which they'd etch away and then use that as the as the gate instead of uh, metal which is what they started with in MOS. Um, you know that's that's kind of a fundamental thing. I don't think there was a specific uh, business thing, but it was it was related to uh, you know something that would be an evolution for the transistor. So you know it was it was within that uh, thing they had to do it. So it it wasn't that you could go out and be a free range you know investigator, but uh, the uh, the there was there were there were things that went on to uh, you know fundamental exploration things but they would ultimately lead toward something that would fit into the semi the end of the transistor business or, or linear in, or integrated circuit business ted just to give a size of, of uh, give a sense of the size of fairchild at that point what was the reporting structure like who did you report to and then how many levels between that person and gordon moore for example um well let's see i would just um in linear integrated circuit uh, thing, there was a there was a guy at the top of that, and then there was a process guy and a circuit guy, and then I was under the process guy. So, and then that uh, guy that was head of linear integrated circuits reported to this uh, the guy that ran device development, and then he reported to Gordon. So there was, let's see, I was so that would put me one, two, three, four levels down from Gordon. Now, you mentioned that there were some military applications to this work. I wonder if you could describe that a little. Um, yeah, I, you know, I, I, they said it was possible for a bomb fuse, but I, I really never knew anything about how uh, it was uh, connected in there. And it was, um, uh, it, it, you know, I, I, I figured it was, a, it was a micropower op amp that I was working on, and so it had some transistors that really perform very well at low um, at low currents and uh, so I mean that's that's really all and that made sense from a you know battery powered uh, kind of application but other than that I didn't uh, really know exactly what they were doing with it so 
you know, I got myself in there and uh, had that secret clearance because of the stuff I was working on. But I, I didn't get a lot of, uh, I wasn't giving a lot of instruction about stuff that I could talk about and couldn't talk about uh, from a military standpoint, because we, you know, on the, on the other hand, we're from a business standpoint, um, all of that stuff is pretty confidential because it's, it's, you know, a lot of it is pre patent and, uh, you know, you want to make sure that you should keep your, um, you know, your business secrets, your, uh, you know, within the company so that, uh, you know, you don't spur some, uh, incremental, more serious competition from a, uh, from a competitor. On that point, who were some of Fairchild's key competitors? Who were the big clients that all of these companies were working to, to, to win contracts for? Um, let's see, you know, I didn't, um, since I was at R and D, I didn't really know exactly who was, uh, who the customers, uh, were, I, you know, that was, this is before we're, you know, a lot of the things that I think about are really things that went on at Intel after I got there. Um, and, uh, I know they did have a, I know that they did have some military business. I wasn't associated with it, so I don't know, but it's the thing that you had to do for the military business is that, um, the devices had to be strong enough to work in, um, um, higher temperature environments and things like that. And had to have, um, um, reliability records that were, that were very good. Um, but other than that, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not, uh, not exactly, uh, sure what they were because it was kind of a long way from the, from the business and marketing part of it. Ted, I wonder if you could paint a picture of what the work environment looked like. In other words, were you in a clean room most of the time? Did you work at a drawing board? What did it look like? Um, I did, I did have a, uh, a clean room coat, but I didn't wear any kind of mask or any, any kind of thing on my head or whatever. Um, we, we had our, you know, our wafers were in a box and, uh, and so they were closed up like that. And then we would drop them off at these different, uh, um, work surfaces. But I, and I, I did, you know, I did have a workbench there where or out there with the uh, lab assistants where we would, uh, take measurements and add data and things like that. So it was mostly electronic. We had curve tracers to look at our, you know, to check our devices and everything else. And, uh, there were things that we could monitor partway through processing. You know, you can look at, um, uh, uh, P N junction breakdown, you know, uh, voltages and stuff like that to tell you, give you some sense of what the, uh, uh, metrics are of the, of the, you know, parameters that you were trying to control, but, um, um, it was not, was not really in a clean room. We did the masking room was pretty clean. I mean, they had, um, uh, yeah, and I don't, we didn't, we didn't have, uh, any, uh, any, uh, fume hoods or anything like any, uh, didn't have any, uh, oh, I'm trying to clean air hoods. Uh, they did in the masking room though, but that was a closed door and never, we didn't get inside of there. Um, likewise in the diffusion areas, we didn't, we didn't go inside either, but those, those had, uh, uh, clean air, uh, uh, devices, but, um, the first place, um, I ever ended up using uh, bunny suits and things like that. And I, I was the first one at, at Intel to do that, but that was in 1973 at, uh, you know, the wafer fab thing that I started there. So that was. That was later. I mean, I'd gotten out of, uh, uh, I'd gotten out of, um, uh, Intel in six, 1968. What were some of the most important raw materials that you worked with during the Fairchild years? Well, um, the, uh, the silicon wafers, of course, are the, one of the big ones. And, you know, they, they, uh, they make those by, uh, starting with a single crystal, uh, down in this hot molten, uh, silicon and they pull it out slowly. And, um, as it, uh, as it, uh, precipitates, uh, because of the coolness on the, on the wafer, it, uh, on the, on the, uh, on the material you're pulling out, it, uh, it, uh, goes into a single crystal wafer. So those had to be single crystal. The thing, uh, uh, 
this tells you how old, how long ago it was, but the wafers we were using were an inch and a half in diameter. And now they're, you know, <laughs> and actually, <laughs> I think I think when I left into I don't know whether we were much bigger than four inch wafers by the time I got of it, out of Intel uh, at uh, at uh, my wafer at my Fab Three wafer Fab uh, I was the first one to do three inch wafers there so uh, you know again that tells you how long ago that was and did you use computers at all during the Fairchild years? Uh let's see. Um, no, I don't think so. I mean, when I when I graduated from college, there were no four function electronic, uh, 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 no four function electronic calculators. In fact, there's a picture of me in the, one of the labs at uh, at when I was working at Fairchild. I I think I had these uh, rayon or um, um, nylon white shirts and uh, you know dress shirts and. A very narrow tie, <laughs> black, black tie. <laughs> One of those short uh, um, uh, slide rolls, you know, the kind that has a folded uh, plastic at the edge and a thing. They're only about this long. The, you know, the big ones were I'd use when I at my desk. But um, um, you know, yeah, no, all the calculations we had to do were were uh, were uh, were that kind of. Uh, we're all slide rule. Now, did or, you have a sense of some of the tensions? Oh, by the way, yeah, let, yeah. Let me, yeah. If to do uh, more, uh, to do higher accuracy calculations that were kind of complicated or whatever, we had, um, uh, you know, and I got this when I was in high school. It's called the uh, uh, Handbook of uh, Mathematical Tables from the Handbook of Chemistry and Physics, and those would give you all of, you know, five place logarithms and things like that. And, uh, you know, you could, you could, you could add those to do multiplications and stuff like that. So we would, uh, we would use, uh, a lot of that, uh, um, you know, to, to do that. And I, it was, it was only a couple of years after that when, you know, the, uh, HP came out with their fancy calculator and all that other stuff. But, uh, no, when we, <laughs> When I started, it was all still slide rule. Now, did you have a sense of some of the tensions that were building up with the Fairchild board that ultimately would lead to the creation of Intel? Uh, no, I did not. I, I, I really, I really didn't. It was, um, it was, it was sort of. I don't know whether it was a board, but I guess there, I guess there was some stuff going on. I'm trying to remember. We had some people. Um, spin off to um, national semiconductor and start that that could have been, that could have stirred up some of the some of the trouble um the um uh yeah i don't there had been you know fairchild was uh, when i when i got to fairchild it was um was nine years old but it's 56 it started in 57 and i was there in 66 so yeah nine nine years and uh they had a they had a plan they were working on but um yeah i don't know i they might have uh, might have been that uh, we were we were a fairly significant company but we were you know we weren't very high in the management structure of, of fairchild camera and instrument when did you first get news that intel was happening um I, it was around, um, uh, right. Well, they left, they, they started Intel in, uh, July of, uh, 68. So it would have been right around that period of, of, of time. I happened to see Gordon Moore and, uh, and, uh, uh, I, uh, he, he'd, uh, I think he had announced his resignment, but, uh, I don't think he, they, you know, I don't think they talked about uh, what it was, but uh, uh, he uh, he said, uh, I, I wish I could remember the 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 thing that he said. It was kind of a lighthearted joke. I said, Well, are you are you going to quit working? And he says, uh, You know, not yet, or whatever. <laughs> he says, What are you going to do? And he says, That's uh, we're working on it. <laughs> 
What did that mean for you professionally? Did you did you give any second thought about joining Intel from the beginning? Um, I well, I you know they, I don't know when they really became um, public about what it was or exactly what their timeline was when they when they left the company. But um, um, it the other thing that was going on is the linear integrated circuit people I were was working with were thinking about starting a company and had a thing. And, and actually one of the, um, that wasn't formalized either, but I'd heard a little bit about, um, you know, what the stock options might be or whatever. And that one was about percentage of the company wise. I think that one was about 10 times what um, the Intel one ended up to be. Um, but my wife, uh, whom I met at uh, Fairchild, um, had started there. We're, we're both the same age. She'd started there right out of high school in uh, 61. So she was working online as a die attacher and, um, uh, and uh, uh, lead bonder and then ultimately got into spec writing and uh, uh, supporting marketing. Uh, but um, uh, when, when I was considering this stuff and uh, uh, we didn't get married and until after I went to Intel, but uh, we were we were pretty close, and uh, she was uh, she was telling me she says, well, she says uh, I would go anywhere with Bob Noyce. I knew Gordon. She says I don't know Gordon that well, but Bob Noyce is uh, wonderful. I would I would go anywhere with him. So it was actually that little bit of extra encouragement that uh, ultimately you know closed the deal. <laughs> To, to clarify, you could have stayed on at Fairchild if you wanted to. I think so, yeah. yeah. Were you part of a larger exodus? In other words, what was the rough percentage of people who left Fairchild to help start up Intel? Yeah, um, well, they were, they were very careful about that. They were worried about any, you know, some kinds of legal things. But there was, a, you know... Uh, during that period of time, I want to say something like 80% of the companies in Silicon Valley came out of Fairchild and uh, uh, Intel didn't want to make a big deal out of it, but uh, a number of the people had worked at Fairchild. Uh, you know, uh, one of the bosses, I, one of my early bosses was uh, Gene Flath. He had been at, uh, he'd been at uh, Fairchild. Um, uh, Tom Rowe, uh, the uh, the guy that worked on MOS, I worked on Bipolar. Uh, we shared an office. Uh, he was MIT, I was Caltech. He was a chemical engineer, I was electrical engineer. So we had tremendous uh, complementary things, and we could we could really help each other a lot on different various things. Uh, he was from uh, Fairchild, um, and um, uh, I think there were some other people from outside of it, but. Um, it was, it was, it, there were a, the, a lot of the significant people were from, were from Fairchild and, uh, but it was not, you know, it wasn't a huge exodus because it wasn't, you know, the company was starting from scratch. So, um, and, you know, National Semiconductor was, was underway and they actually, they actually probably sucked away more than Intel did in the, in the, right in that era. Uh, later on, after that happened, they, hired uh, Lester Hogan from, and I, I can't, I can't do the whole time frame in my head from, uh, from Motorola. And he brought a, he brought a whole bunch of, uh, of people over. They, there were so many people, they actually uh, named them Hogan's heroes. <laughs> Did you have any so, direct contact with Gordon Moore during these, during this, this transition period? Um, uh, I did after I after I started working there. Well, he and he and Andy Grove scheduled a meeting, scheduled a luncheon with me to uh, make an offer to get me to uh, to come to work. And uh, they uh, it was uh, it, it, it turns out it was to have me work with Carver, as I told you before. But uh, when at the luncheon they said, uh, well. We can't. Uh, uh, we have a confidential uh, position we want you to take. We can't tell you what it what it is. And I said, well, that's not very motivating. Um, and I said, uh, so I just thought about it. A little bit, and and she, they said, we don't want you to discuss this offer with anybody. I said, okay, I can, 
I can do that. But, and then I, then as I got in a little, I said, well, is, could I, could I ask my advisor at Caltech about this? And they said, yeah, that'd be fine, but just, you know, keep it confidential with him. I said, okay. So I did call Carver and I talked to him on the phone and he says, <clears throat> oh yeah, they want you to work with me and Jim McCaldin <laughs> on uh, zinc sulfide light emitting diodes. And I said, oh wow, that, well, that's kind of interesting. <laughs> So, um, uh, that, uh, that sound, and, but by the way, at that, in that, uh, in that assignment, I would be reporting to Bob Noyce and Gordon Moore and, but I had to come down to Pasadena, set up a lab and, uh, you know, I actually ended up building my workbench and other kinds of things just to get this whole thing going. And, uh, but it, uh, it was, uh, and, and, and Bob and Gordon would come down every once in a while to, uh, to visit and talk about it and see it, but, uh, that probably only a couple of times while I was there. And I only did this for six months, but, uh, that was, uh, the genesis of it. And, uh, I did get a, a thousand share, um, uh, original, um, stock option. Um, uh, and it's split a few times since then. Just so a it's, few. <laughs> the, the $5 price went down to 14 uh, 14 cents, I want to say, or something like that. <laughs> Ted, do you have a sense of how Noyce and Moore got the funding together to launch Intel? Yeah, I think it's the same way they, well, you know, they used Art Rock when they started Fairchild. Uh, Bob and Gordon were um, two of what they call the Trader S8. You've heard that before, I yeah. presume. Yeah. And, uh, uh, they had to sort of recruit Noyce, uh, but he was the he was the senior one and uh, really the one that would sort of be in charge. But he was uh, a little iffier about leaving uh, Fairchild. Um, I mean, maybe he thought he had a chance of replacing Shock, or I, he was a he was the one that uh, was a little bit iffy about leaving Shockley, and uh, you know maybe he thought he had a chance of taking that over, uh, but. Um, Anyway, he, uh, uh, they, the the remaining seven, you know, twisted his arm and got him to come to uh, uh, Fairchild. They ended up. Um, I was obviously wasn't called Fairchild, but they ended up. I, the story I remember is that they had a, they wrote up a two-page summary of uh, what they were trying to do, and um, they got uh, Art Rock to uh, uh, help them. Uh, you know, get the money. And he, he went around and talked to various people and they finally found that Fairchild Cameron instrument was, was willing to uh, fund this thing. Ted, how so, much of the, the creation of Intel do you think was about just not being associated with Fairchild and how much of it was, this was really an opportunity to move the engineering in a new direction? Um, well, um, I think it was probably noise that uh, somebody had the thought that it was about time to uh, put semiconductors into memory. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, core memory was, uh, you know, it's got some fragility and uh, it's kind of technology and whatnot. And what I, was, what was memory like before semiconductors? Core memory, um, you know, where you have a little circle of uh, magnetic stuff that you can magnetize one way or the other. And uh, you know they had a they had a matrix like this through them so that you could select the one you were trying to uh, encode, and then they had a a wire that went all the way through so that you could um, you could go back and sense which way the thing was uh, was uh, magnetized. But that was the original. They called it core memory, if you remember the terminology. But that's what they had. They 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 probably had a little bit of memory here and there in different circuits, um, but um, they really weren't any you know full purpose uh, you know semiconductor memories in those days. And what was the motivation? Is this more memory? Is it faster processing? What is it? I, I think yeah, some of all of that, um, and uh, uh, you know they uh, the uh, you know. Moore had uh, uh, proposed his rule in, uh, I want to say it's the spring of 65. He wrote that uh, article in uh, Electronics Magazine about, um, and then.
Um, yeah, I, it looked like it had changed um, uh, modem in my house here, so I went back to the one that I know is stronger. Okay. Um, anyway, so where did the, where, what was I saying when I dropped off? Just the the question about the motivations for Intel about being independent versus creating new new um, engineering. Yeah, I think well, I think that Moore's law thing, uh, and you looking at memory. You know, one of the nice things about uh, when you do a startup, one of the hard things is always the product definition, trying to come up with something that people will buy. Well, the nice thing about memory is all you have to do is pick a power of two, you know, and <laughs> that's how big it's going to be is sort of. And so I think that was a factor. And I think uh, I think uh, probably noise. He was he was uh, more into the commercial aspect of things and whatnot uh, across the board. And you know, good at marketing and whatever else. Um, he's probably the one that thought that this is probably the sweet spot where we uh, should probably get in ahead of the herd and, and, and do that. So that was the, that was the motiv motivation, motiv motivation about that. And, um, uh, you know, and they, they actually were doing it with two transistor technologies. You know, I worked on the one and this Tom Rowe worked on the other one with, well, I mean, obviously we had, teams help it working with us as well, but, uh, um, you know, getting the masking room open, getting the diffusion thing open, getting the, um, uh, you know, the deposition area going. So, yeah, um, that was, by the way, I, um, I also had to work on the, on the, um, metal, uh, deposition area cause I'd had experience with that. So in addition to working on the, um, and I had a technician helping helping me, but um, so I, I I worked on that as well as um, the uh, bipolar process. Ted, did the move to Intel require a physical relocation for you? Um, it did actually, um, not for hardly anybody else, but uh, because I was going to be working with Carver, I actually uh, moved down to. Uh, uh, Pasadena, and um, I moved in with one of my classmates, uh, Jerry Parker, um, who uh, was, uh, he went all the way through his PhD with uh, Carver. We were both in the same undergraduate class, good friends, um, and we had another friend, Jeff Wise, who uh, came to Fairchild R&D with me. He, he got into the transducer section. I did that. Um, Parker would come to work in the summer. I think he was working for HP one summer and some others. So, we, you know, we would we would collaborate on <laughs> living space, you know, where wherever we were. But um, yes, I was um, I was with uh, with Jerry Parker and he was uh, uh, Carverson. So he was well aware. In fact, when I um, decided after about six months there that we were running out of gas and being able to get uh, make progress here. He's the one who um, uh, actually replaced me for a while in that lab and worked on the zinc sulfide for a bit longer uh, with Carver Mead after he got his PhD. What were the circumstances of Carver's partnership with Intel right from the beginning? Um, let's see. Well, um, he he thought that this was a was a good thing to start. I, he approached uh, Gordon about funding it, and so I think they. Uh, I don't know exactly what all the details were, but uh, uh, obviously my salary was probably part of that, and other things. But and I don't. And I think they knew that I had other skills, uh, you know, besides just um, just uh, the the stuff that they were looking for. Um, but. Um, uh, I think I think that was it. I think uh, I think he probably got some stock for you know working on that as well or for offering it. And uh, the other guy, Jim McCaldin, was really the good uh, material scientist. He was also a Caltech professor. Um, later on, he uh, ended up uh, um, getting prostate cancer, and uh, you know, but that I mean that was after Intel decided. I think that that was after Intel decided not to continue ahead with the um, with the uh, uh, zinc sulfide stuff now but he yeah he, Park, Parker actually um, ended up finding some improvements on on actually making the making the uh, diode more efficient so 
you know, we both we both kicked in there. I mean, there was work to do, and obviously today, I mean, that's that's the LED that we all use. But I mean, if you think about this, this was 60 years ago when we were trying to get this going. Now, were you full time in Pasadena? Would you travel up to headquarters frequently? Um, not very much. I more to see my girlfriend Ginger. <laughs> you know, it was you could. I think I think uh, trips were like fifteen bucks each way in those days, and uh, so I would, you know, I could go for the weekend if I wanted to. I didn't go every weekend, but if, you know, if something was going on or whatever, we, you know, I'd, I'd go up there. I was also since I was living the 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 place we were renting, I think it was about three blocks from uh, Colorado Boulevard. So uh, we Jerry and I actually had a. New Year's Eve party there and uh, people stayed over and we could walk up to to see the Rose Parade the the, the next day, <laughs> the next morning. Now, was the office any bigger than just you? Were there anybody else, any other people in, in, in the Pasadena branch? There was not. It was, um, um, it was over on, I think it was over on Walnut um, and uh, uh, it was on the second floor, which was a little bit of a challenge because we, um, I had to get liquid nitrogen up there for the uh, for the uh, evaporation. We had one evaporation thing, had one uh, one little uh, furnace we could use for diffusion, but um, that was about all we had. And um, actually, it really wasn't much of an office. It was really just more of a lab that I had, and uh, I, I worked out of there pretty much all by myself. I would have um, lunch with um, uh, Jim and uh, Carver uh, at least every other week, sometimes every week. Uh, I like to go to Bob's Big Boy, which used to be right across from PCC there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, I assume the creation of the Pasadena office was simply the proximity to Carver. Was that the main motivation? That's it. That's it. And yes. what what was Carver working on that was so important to Intel at this point? What was the the big strategy there? Um, well, I think it was um, getting a um, a light source that was um, uh, much more environmentally much more uh, much more environmentally safe, but uh, really um, it was really a power consumption thing. You know, I mean, the LEDs are so much more efficient than um, filament bulbs, you know, that, uh, that, uh, that was the whole thing. So that's, that's what I, that's what I think was the big, uh, uh, uh opportunity. Was that effective for you working on your own mostly? Is that how you do your best work? Um, it, uh, it was okay. I mean, there was, um, um, you know, yeah, I mean, most, most of the research that I had done was pretty much, aimed at, uh, just what I was doing, you know, I, it was the, the tasks that I had, the tasks that I were giving on these individual devices was, um, you know, I, I, I could pretty much handle that. I mean, it didn't mean that I knew everything about everything there was, but at, uh, in terms of, uh, doing the experiments, uh, you know, uh, uh, I could run several at a time and, you know, sort of try and figure out what, uh, what was what things we needed to do next and yeah but i was i was pretty much on my own and but were I, you self-directed were people from hq sort of you know telling you what to do no it was really more um what uh, um uh what uh, carver and jim mccaldin we would discuss there and uh, you know i actually i actually figured out uh, pretty early on how to make an omic contact on uh, zinc sulfide, which was really kind of interesting. I mean, if you look at zinc sulfide, it's, um, uh, you know, the forbidden gap is large enough. You can actually see through it. You know, it's, it's, a it's, a it's a open crystal, uh, you know, it's a, uh, crystal that light passes through. So, you know, okay, how do you connect a wire to that? Well, <laughs> I, you know, I was able to figure that out with, uh, some of my alloy and material science experience and, Actually, even including you know some of the some of the stuff that I picked up from my dad. What were your key achievements during the Pasadena years? What are you most proud of? Yeah, it was not a Pasadena year. It was six months for me. Just six um, months. 
Yeah, yeah. So the big one was that uh, um, figuring out that only contact and, uh, you know, and, and the other one, just getting the, the lab set up, there was quite a bit of stuff to do just to bring it together. Um, and then, you know, you talked about most of my direction was from Carver and Jim, but Bob Noyce and uh, I know Gordon, they visited me uh, probably twice while I was down there just to see what it was. And they would get briefings from Carver and Jim and, you know, where we were and whatnot uh, as well. Now, was, was the Pasadena six months, was it meant to be that short-lived, or what were the circumstances of going back to HQ? Well, the uh, the circumstances were that uh, I, I had sort of, you know, I was working on this, I was going through and over and over and whatnot, and I, we, having, I was, getting this only contact was pretty exciting, but I was, we were having trouble getting the, you um, uh, the lighting part of it to, uh, well, I was having trouble getting the lighting part of it to be more and more effective. And so, um, uh, I, I was telling, uh, Gordon, I says, I'm not, I'm not sure we can keep, you know, whether we're going to get there from here. Um, and I said, I think I might want to uh, come back and help with the silicon stuff. And um, I think that was a big piece of it. But Carver and Jim weren't willing to give up, so they recruited this other guy to to work there, Jerry Parker. And they continued on this work for Intel. Yeah, for another for another six months, I want to say some probably something like that. Did anything come of that? They they he did find some processing things about uh, um, about how to treat the surface of where you're going to put the. Uh, the metal device where the uh, the light would be made and uh, cleaned up some of that stuff, but it wasn't uh, um, it wasn't perfect. So um, I think I think that's sort of how it timed out, or maybe I don't know what the full what the final story was because I was off doing other stuff. But um, could have been um, you know Gordon talking with Carver and Jim, and you know they just decided whether or not to go further ahead or not. Ted, what was it like when you got back to to Intel headquarters? What did you slide into at that point? Um, well, um, I was, uh, you know, going back to work on semiconductor process development like I had before, and um, my assignment was the um, uh, was the bipolar portion, which was, you know, perhaps a little little simpler, had a little bit smaller memory product that we ultimately wanted to do, but um, the uh, uh, it was uh, it was pretty good. They you know they they it was uh, they had their fab area there, and I could process stuff uh, through it. And I actually had to you know as I said uh, be responsible for the aluminum uh, deposition equipment with uh, with a technician that I had. Um, but uh, it was I mean it was pretty much starting from scratch. They had actually. It was kind of funny. They had a, they sort of had a contest between uh, uh, Gordon Moore, Bob Noyce, and and uh, versus Andy Grove about uh, being able to make some uh, um, an MOS capacitor that would be uh, that would be stable, didn't have stuff in it. Uh, how to make a, a, a PN junction? You know, these were just sort of early tests on to get the lab up and running. Um, uh, I think that was going on while I was, uh, well, it might've been, might've been just still going on when I was there cause they had to pull in all the equipment and everything else. But, um, uh, you know, it was, uh, it was really, it was really interesting. I mean, uh, they, when I, when I told, uh, when, when, uh, uh, when I talked to Gordon and Andy about that, Andy was the one who said, well, we, we want to do this. Uh, we want to use this process that, uh, that you're, Schottky diode, Ted, that you came up with uh, at uh, Fairchild um, can do, and you don't have to gold dope the wafers. You just have to put a, a, a metal semiconductor junction in parallel with the collector base junction so that it doesn't forward bias when you um, uh, switch all the way down. And, and then, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the gold was to make the lifetime of those minority carriers out there um, disappear so that the switch would be quicker, but the uh, metal semiconductor contact would keep 
any of those things from being emitted in there. And then, you know, it was uh, uh, fundamentally the, the quickest way you could make the switch. So they wanted to use that. So that was kind of fun. And, uh, and Are you still there? Yeah, you just came back. Oh, okay. how? What did you miss? You, it's it, that was fun. Was the last thing that you said. Um, how long was I? Um, just a few seconds. It was really like your oh, last sentence. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Well, I. I mean, I was. I basically uh, was challenged to uh, put that together, and it uh, it went well, and uh, you know, worked out worked out fine. Ted, for the last part of our talk today, just I, I'd like to ask for your sense of when Intel started to feel, I don't know if the term startup was in use at that point, but when did Intel start to feel like it was solid, that it would become this massively important company? Was it right from the beginning? Was there sort of a transition period that you recall? Um, on, the, on the technology and operational side and everything else, I thought that, I thought that went really great. The um, the people that we had uh, to uh, run marketing were um, uh, they actually ended up uh, having some difficulty or whatever, and we had to swap those out. And uh, we actually ended up uh, recruiting. Um, uh, so so from a from a technology so from a sales side, um, it was uh, you know we also were starting from scratch there as well because there were no. There weren't really wasn't any semiconductor memories out there and, and what they were doing. So we we had to, uh, you know, and we weren't as big as, uh, you know, most of these things needed. So, I mean, a disk memory was really the, the biggest type that they, that people could use. Um, the the semiconductor memory was a, was a lot faster. And uh, so but we had to we had to get it scaled up. So there was there was that part of it. But then. Um, there was also the part of uh, of uh, figuring out how to uh, how to sell it, and we that was probably one of the larger challenges. It wasn't too bad, but we did have to. Um, uh, we actually ended up making some uh, workstations that would help uh, people uh, design these things because we had some we had some uh, different kinds of memory, and uh, they. Uh, and they would have to design their products to, you know, the, the systems products that would take these things so that they would so they use it in the best way. And you really need marketing people to do that and to figure out um, uh, how to define or, you know, how to, uh, what sort of parts of the systems would this, would this high speed, higher speed, um, um, maybe not as dense memory would, would go. So that, that needed, uh, that needed work and that took some time, but we, we ramped up, uh, we ramped up pretty good. Um, and, uh, you know, so that went pretty well. There were, there were times when, um, uh, early on where, uh, you get into where you're selling this product, uh, semiconductor is really on the front end of capital expenses in the business places. So it can be a little more volatile than, um, uh, actually the original economic uh, 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 cycles uh, because, uh, you know, uh, well, it's, you, you can look back on this COVID thing. Uh, you know, we ended up buying a lot of computers when that first started and now it's been, you know, people don't need any more and they're going back to work. So they've got equipment there and whatever. So, you know, it'll, it'll, um, it'll be a little back and forth. Uh, here. So that was, um, that was not something that we understood very well, but we, we ended up hiring some people from, uh, and I'm trying to remember exactly when that was. It wasn't probably wasn't super early on because we used the original people that they hired uh, from Fairchild to do that. But um, uh, after a while, we did need to upgrade our our capability there, and, and so that was that happened. But um, as a as a as a as a startup, it was a pretty good model, though I think. For you coming to headquarters, did you see that as putting your career on a trajectory of leadership? Was that a step up coming from Pasadena? Um, well, 
I, I wanted to be in a place where I could make a contribution. So, you know, um, uh, we really didn't have any sort of structure there. I mean, you know, I was the 22nd employee. We, you know, I, I, uh, you can take a look at that picture of us at 365 yeah. Middlefield Road. Yeah. I don't can't remember exactly when that was taken and, and uh, what it was, but I mean, there, it wasn't uh, the, uh, the management was, uh, let's say a little less uh, formal. I mean, we did have uh, one guy, Gene Flath had all the people that worked in the wafer fab area were, worked for him. We had a MOS design guy, uh, Les Vedez. And we had a, 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 a bipolar design group, uh, Dick Bone, and uh, and then we had some market, you know, marketing guys and everything else. And 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 all of those operational people worked for Andy Grove. So, and and you know, he would uh, he would uh, just like he when we were at Fairchild R and D, we'd write a monthly uh, 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 report on what we had done, and uh, he would you know he would uh, edit the thing and and then publish the whole whole deal. Um, uh, as we uh, as we would do it, and it was uh, so. You know, it was it was pretty informal there. I mean, there was uh, uh, you know I would get emails. Or no, we didn't have emails, but we would pass around notes, and you know I would get some uh, some uh, some communications. You know, from him from time to time, whatever. Um, I <laughs> as a joke one time I wrote. Uh, uh, was working on something there and I said so and so collaborated my uh, or corroborated my results and he said uh, no you mean uh, collaborate and I said uh, and then I wrote it back and I said no corroborate is a legitimate word and because uh, I I could come across it when I was studying Latin in junior high school but and so then he wrote <laughs> wrote me back and he says Bastard is a legitimate word too. <laughs> <laughs> but we would we would have we would have funny exchanges like that. We and you know we were able to interact with him uh, personally, even you know while we were all there in Palo Alto, and then even after um, I went out to Livermore and you know ran that fab there. Well, Ted, last question for today. When you moved back to headquarters, did you remain in close contact with Carver? Was that important for you personally and for what Intel was doing at that point? Uh, we did. Um, um, we did have some uh, events, and or, or I did wasn't wasn't communicating a lot. I mean, I obviously I thought that the stuff we were working on was a little confidential. I, you know, I didn't, uh, and and I was busy doing that. Uh, I didn't uh, didn't. Uh, need necessarily anything from him but he would come up for consulting and he would uh, um, usually have lunch with us or with me and jeff wise since we were the ones working there he did come up uh, one time and he was uh, having lunch with gordon and he said i would like to have my uh, uh, could my students join us and so it, jeff wise and i carver and gordon moore were were there for lunch together um, I can't remember. We, we didn't have a cafeteria at Fairchild R and D. Um, well, but wait, maybe we did. I, I but I, I think we went out. We went somewhere out for lunch. But um, we were talking about it since Carver was there. I had just discovered this. Um, well, that was. This is when I was at. Uh, this was when I when I was at Fairchild, um, and uh, I still want to tell the story. He. Uh, that's where I told him that, uh, hey, I I was looking at this uh, aluminum silicon contact and, and it found this uh, device and it actually turns out to be a Schottky diode. And he said, uh, he said, what? How did you? Do? Or, or Gordon said that. What? How did you? What did you do? So they were they were both pretty pretty much amazed at that. Uh, so, but after at Intel. Um, I don't think uh, Carver was doing any consulting for that. I, I would do it just based, you know, there's a, there's a time when your connection with your alma mater, it, when you're first out of school, yes, you can do that. And, um, uh, but when you uh, have children and you get into that period of your life, then 
nothing goes on, but when they can, they drive again, then you re-engage. There so, you go. I know all about yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, you know all about that. So anyway, sorry about um, uh, uh, throwing that other story in there. but No, not uh, at all. Not at all. But it was uh, it was one way that uh, stayed with Carver. And, you know, um, it was more formal after that. I mean, I got uh, 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 Melton Chang to uh, uh, host, a, I think it was a 70th birthday party for Carver at his house in Silicon Valley. And, uh, you know, we did we did that. So I would I would and I would come and see him when I was on campus. But I, I wasn't on a lot of committees or anything else in those days. So it, didn't seem too much, but well, Ted. In our next conversation, we'll pick up when you return to Intel and the big projects there going forward. Yeah, go ahead. What you, you probably have a place to go, but one of the things that I did do is I did. Um, uh, I, I was talking to uh, Robert Perkins about this. Um, um, Carver got that co- uh, uh, the Kyoto, Kyoto Prize. Prize. Yeah, yeah. Um, one of the things that I did when I was running this fab area up there is. Uh, Carver um, asked me if I could process his wafers for him. And uh, I said, yeah, I could do that. And I didn't tell Gord, I didn't tell any of the management in at Intel that I was doing that. <laughs> this is when I'm 73 or 74, but uh, I processed all of 